Peter Van Inwagen wrote an article called The Consequence Argument. This argument is against compatibilism and has the conclusion that incompatibilism is true. Let's start by adding some definitions and principles. If you're not familiar with modal logic notation, uh, this is a quick overview of what's needed for understanding the argument. If you are, you can move ahead a minute or so. Uh, a necessary truth is going to be one that cannot possibly be false. In other words, it has to be true. And no matter how the universe is rearranged, it is going to be true. That's a necessary truth. And we identify these with the box symbol in front of a statement. So when you see the box, that means that what follows is a necessary truth. Now, continuing with some definitions and principles. Now, these are unique. Van Inwagen is introducing these terms of art here, and he provides these very specific definitions. So I'm sticking really closely to the text on this throughout the video. Uh, you may notice a variation or two. An untouchable proposition, or you know, a truth, a fact, that is a true proposition such that nothing anyone is or ever has been able to do might have had the consequence that it was false. Now this is very strong, obviously, and an untouchable proposition. You and I can't do anything about it. It's untouchable to us, right? We can't do anything to make it false. Now, a couple rules are needed in order for the argument to work, and one is the necessity rule. It seems pretty obvious that if P is a necessary truth, something that cannot possibly be false, then P is going to be an untouchable proposition, something that no one could do anything to possibly make it false, right? And then we have the conditional rule. So it's an untouchable truth that P, it's an untouchable truth that this conditional is true. If P then Q, no one can do anything about that connection between P and Q. Therefore, it's an untouchable truth that Q. So this seems reasonable. If no one can do anything that might have made P false, and no one could possibly do anything that might have made the conditional if P then Q false, then it seems to follow that Q is also an untouchable truth, something that no one could possibly do anything about to make it false. Okay, so how do we apply the conditional rule? Here's an example. Suppose it's an untouchable truth that the sun explodes in the year 2027. So it explodes, there's nothing anyone could possibly have done that might have made it false that it explodes. And of course, it seems to be an untouchable truth that if the sun explodes in the year 2027, then all life on earth ends in the year 2027. And for those of you who do astronomy, uh, let's rule out the last day of the year in the last few minutes of December 31st, okay, just to be clear there. Hence, if these two are untouchable truths, then it would be an untouchable truth that all life on earth ends in the year 2027. Right? If nothing could do about the, the first fact that the sun explodes, no one could do anything about the fact that that connection, if the sun explodes, then life on earth ends, well, then no one could do anything about the fact that life on earth ends in the year 2027. Okay, so now we understand the conditional rule, how it works. Let's put the necessity rule, the conditional rule to work in the consequence argument. So we're going to, again, stay very closely with the text of Van Inwagen. Let P sub zero here, so P is a proposition 
that is a complete description of the whole universe sometime in the distant past. Now, what do we mean by distant past? We mean at least uh, further back in the past than the time at which anyone on Earth alive today was alive. So let's go back 120 years at least. Uh, you could obviously say, all right, we'll go back 200 years. We can go back 1,000 years. We could go back a million years. But we have a proposition, however far back we go, that's a complete description of the entire universe at some time in the distant past. Everything that's true about the universe at that point in time is included in this extremely, exceedingly, crazily long proposition. And then L is going to be the conjunction of all the laws of nature. Now, if you're familiar with David Lewis's arguments about compatibilism, these propositions should be also familiar. Right? These, these are very similar to what Lewis used. In fact, Lewis used L in the exact same way Lewis used an H for what Van and Wagen is calling P sub zero. Okay, so here's the argument. If determinism is true, well, we have a consequence of determinism. So this is just part of the definition of determinism. It's necessarily the case that if P and L are both true, then Pettit makes a video on PVI's consequence argument. Not the same proposition that Van Enwagen used, but this will work, right? If determinism is true and everything was set in the time of the distant past, then and you get the law of nature, that, then it's just a consequence from that that I make this video on the consequence argument. Okay, so that's logically equivalent to, since it, we, we take the conjunction and we clarify that that's logically equivalent to these same things, but it's in a conditional form. So if the first one's true, then this second one has to be true necessarily. If P is true, then if L is true, then Pettit makes a video on PVI's consequence argument. So uh, this is nothing odd that anyone would quibble about. It just follows from modal logic and, and normal non-modal logic, right? Propositional logic. Okay, so third premise. It's an untouchable truth that P is true, right? That seems reasonable. There's nothing anyone can do now or anyone during their lifetime who exists now could have done anything to make anything about the distant past false so that it might even have been false. We can't time travel, etc. So it's an untouchable truth that P0 is true. We can't make it the case that Lincoln was not assassinated, for example. Nobody can do anything about that. All right, and then four, it's an untouchable truth that if P is true, then if L is true, then Pettit makes a video on PVI's consequence argument, right? So. We're, we're starting with this idea of determinism. We have these necessary truths from that. Well, it seems obvious that it would be an untouchable truth that if those things are true, if P's true, then if L's true, well, then Pettit's going to make a video on the consequence argument. Follows by our first conditional involving determinism. So hence, it's an untouchable truth that if L is true, since we already have P being true, we just, this is just modus ponens here. It's an untouchable truth that if L is true, then Pettit makes a video on PVI's consequence argument. Okay, now, it seems to be obvious that it's an untouchable truth that L is true, right? None of us can change the laws of nature. We can't break the laws of nature. We can't modify the laws of nature. There's nothing we can do that might make them different. And it's an untouchable truth then that if L is true, then Pettit makes a video on PVI's consequence argument. And we put these together and we have, it's an untouchable truth that Pettit makes a video on PVI's consequence argument. Obviously I've been saying PVI for Peter Van Inwagen. Uh, sorry, it's a 
uh, a habit from grad school when I worked with them. Okay, so now that's just about me making this video. Who cares about that? Well, obviously, the argument's easily generalized over anything that anyone has ever done. You watching the video, for example, the, the getting dressed this morning and putting the clothes on that you have on now, that would be included as an untouchable truth. So now we have, if determinism is true, we don't have free will, right? Everything that we've ever done is something that is untouchable. We have no control over. We can't do anything about it. So we have no free will. And that idea that if determinism is true, then we have no free will, that's incompatibilism. You cannot have them both. You cannot have both determinism and free will. So the conclusion here is incompatibilism is true. So this, again, as I said at the start, it's an argument against compatibilism, right? Obviously, if incompatibilism is true, compatibilism is false. It's obviously an argument for incompatibilism. Okay, what might somebody say in response to the argument? How might you criticize it? Well, if you're going to reject the argument, yeah, it's, since it's uh, valid, it seems, or we have the principles that, that are being used, we have to call into question the truth of one of the premises or whether or not the, those principles introduced are used properly to make a valid argument. Okay, so you have to deny the truth of one or more of the following. You have to get rid of the necessity rule. That's the one that we introduced uh, that would make the argument invalid if the necess necessity rule is not true. Now that seems like a really odd path to take right? The idea that something's a necessary truth, but yet we could do something about it that might make it false, that doesn't make any sense. So it's pretty hard to, to reject that. Or the conditional rule is true. And we said that that is a, an untouchable uh, proposition that, you know, if it's untouchable that P, then if it, it's untouchable that if P, then Q, therefore it'd be untouchable uh, that Q, uh, this seems to be quite reasonable. Or, I mean, you could deny that the past is something that could possibly be changed by something that we do, but that doesn't seem right. And I don't think even David Lewis would object to that claim. Or L is an untouchable truth. You might deny that, but that would mean that you could do something to change the laws of nature, and that just doesn't seem right. Okay, so of those four claims that you would have to deny in order to reject the strength of the argument, it's most likely the conditional rule that's the weak link. And Van Inwagen says this, um, if there is a weak link to the argument, it's in the conditional rule, of course, Van Inwagen believes that the conditional rule itself is a valid principle, and this has spawned uh, quite a bit of literature that I'm not going to address. Obviously, various people uh, writing uh, arguments against it and other people writing arguments defending it and typically modifying it slightly when they defend it, but modifying it in a way that it could do the same role that it's done in this argument so that you could argue for the truth of incompatibilism. Okay, that's the consequence argument. I wanna do one more thing. It's kind of a bonus slide here. If we have the consequence argument, then here's an argument for libertarianism. It seems that when we make moral evaluations, when we say about someone else that they have done something morally wrong and we make a judgment, they shouldn't have done that. She shouldn't have been so rude. He shouldn't have done that to her. Something like that. We assume that there are genuine alternative possibilities. When we're making those judgments, we assume that the person could have done something other than what they, in fact, did. This applies to ourselves as well, of course. If we make a judgment about ourselves and say, I shouldn't have said that, 
I, I can't believe that I said that. Um, I should have just kept my mouth shut. We're assuming that we could have kept our mouth shut in that situation. So moral value evaluations assume these genuine alternative possibilities. That means that moral responsibility implies that we have metaphysical freedom. Metaphysical freedom includes these alternative possibilities. It's not the kind of freedom that many compatibilists talk about where as long as you're moving or acting according to your psychological states, you're free. Now, it seems like it's an important aspect of freedom that we have these genuine options, that it's up to us what, which way the future goes. And moral responsibility seems to imply that we have that. And in fact, we are sometimes morally responsible. So this is a premise, the idea that yes, the world is such that people are sometimes morally responsible for what they do, whether it's a heinous crime or a minor uh, uh, thing like uh, taking a paper clip home from work that somebody says is, is morally wrong. Okay, so we can conclude from these premises that we do have metaphysical freedom, right? If we are morally responsible and moral evaluations assume that we have metaphysical freedom, so that means that we have metaphysical freedom, and that's the view of libertarianism. We have the kind of freedom that involves options. So that's the, the close, the obviously consequence argument uh, ended on the previous slide, and uh, we'll explore some more topics in free will on future videos.